Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How's it going, Autumn? It's going, you know. Andrew, that view is absolutely beautiful. I know, he's making us jealous. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Where's I'm Andrew Utah. at? Wow. I'm in Utah. I'm going to have to miss today's lab. I'm sorry. Oh, bummer. <laughs> I think I would too. I would too. Yeah. I love Utah. It's pretty out there. It is. What part of Utah are you in? I'm out, outside of Park City. I'm at Snowbird. Oh, okay, cool. Why, why are you doing this to us? Oh, you know. <laughs> Your fire looks cozy too. <laughs> That's almost the same, right? <laughs> sure. We'll go with that. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, I've been uh, having some difficulties getting the uh, Zoom to work this morning. I've had other difficulties as well. It's been a very exciting time. Uh, I do, I had three people that ended up taking their uh, tests without their accommodation. Uh, I've now reset that so those people can take them until the 31st with the appropriate, uh, the with the test. appropriate rules and whatnot. So hopefully that'll work out better. For the test, each time I took it, I only had 35 out of the 40 questions. So Yeah, happened. something happened. One of my banks, I don't know, it got corrupted or something because uh, basically there was five uh, different questions that were supposed to come out of another bank. Uh, or actually, it might have been because uh, I haven't tracked down exactly which bank was missing. But it might have been five questions from five different banks or five, diff uh, five questions from the same bank. I suspect it's five questions from the same bank that didn't come in. So there's the problem yeah i was surprised but like i literally couldn't do anything about it yeah <laughs> it's not a big deal it's just uh now your grade is however <laughs> many you got right divided by 35 instead of by 40. so hopefully that'll help uh, anybody else have any questions about anything Um, uh, I don't have any questions, but I appreciate you getting back to me at a uh, good time. And I want to apologize for sending that email so late. I've just had a busy weekend. No, no problem. Uh, uh, I haven't been sleeping that well, which is kind of a bummer. But at the same time, uh, I'm getting a buttload of work done. So that makes me feel a little better. Yeah, I haven't been sleeping well either. So I think we're. I think it's just because we're almost done with this semester. So everything's just kind of going crazy for me. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna hope that's the case. <laughs> so anyways, but yeah, yeah, you're welcome. No problem. I don't care what time you email me. I just, you know, uh, I don't I make sure it doesn't ping. So then I don't have any problems with whether or not it uh, uh, if you send an email late or whatever. So I've set this one. Ah, there it is. Okay, I got one more. I got, no, I got that set up. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just checking over the names of the people that uh, uh, ended up getting the wrong kind of test set up for them. Uh, um, I have a question. Yes, go for it. After class, would you mind, like, would you be able to stay for a couple minutes? I just had a couple questions about the test that I got wrong on one version, but they were right on the other. And then I like looked them up after the fact and I'm it seemed like I was putting the right answer, but I got them wrong. So yeah, that uh, who's just asking this question is Abigail. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No problem whatsoever. Uh, sometimes there's literally like one small word change difference between say the question that you quote unquote got right with one uh, answer and then got wrong with the same answer. Uh, but sometimes there's been uh, some changes. If you if you find an inconsistency between the practice test and this test, then it's almost certain uh, that kind of boo boo just because uh, I didn't make any changes to the to the uh, banks. But we'll, we'll check it out. It's no big deal. And I can pull up your specific test and find out your specific uh, uh, questions to see which ones you're talking about. So it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, yeah, I also took pictures of them, so. Okay, that helps, yeah. Yeah, whenever y'all think, think you got something wrong, go ahead and snap a photo of it. Uh, if you don't, don't do that with the homework system because that's probably some kind of copyright violation or whatever. Uh, I mean, other, other than just taking a picture and then showing it to me and then throwing it away, just don't post it anywhere because that, that could get you into some trouble. 
Uh, but yeah, do that with me anytime. It's, it's no problem. Of course, I don't want you post them anywhere either because sometimes they, well, I always use a lot of the same banks, but I, I never use the same tests. Anybody else have anything? Well, I finally figured out all three of the people that uh, that had their tests set up improperly. So they're now fixed. You have until Wednesday to take that. I gave you one extra attempt uh, because uh, all of you took at least one attempt. So I gave you one extra attempt. Uh, and of course you get the uh, whatever you're allowed, double time, time and a half, that sort of thing. So good luck for everyone. And overall the test didn't look too bad. So that was kind of nice. Uh, of course it looked bad if you were thinking it was graded out of 40. <laughs> if you graded out 35, it's not so bad. Uh, anyways, we're now moving into chapter 17, which is where we talk about high mass stars. You'll notice there's a little blurb in the chapter where they talk about sort of medium mass stars. Remember those ones from uh, three solar masses to eight solar masses. And they basically talk about them as how they're so similar, though there's something slightly different going on inside. Their, their end game is sort of the same as the low mass stars. But like I said, it's just a different shell burning as opposed to uh, exactly the same as the low mass stars. So you'll, you're getting all of that, believe it or not. And then in the next chapter, we'll talk about black holes. So that's kind of cool when we get into relativity and, and stuff of that sort. That's the only thing I, I dislike about this particular book is it doesn't cover relativity until like chapter 18. Uh, it mentions it here and there, but uh, that kind of bothers me a little bit. Let me see if I can go ahead and do my share screen. Yes, I can. And it appears because I was so impatient, I have 18 versions of chapter 17 opened uh, for PowerPoint. So isn't that great? <laughs> I'm going to enable, there's my Dr. Hibbert laugh. <laughs> yes, you should pick one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So I think this is it. We should be good to go. Evolution of high mass stars. So does anybody have any questions about the low mass stars and how that went on? Because this is a lot building on that. Uh, it's almost the same scenarios. Uh, because of the higher mass and therefore higher pressures and temperatures at the core, uh, you get slightly different steps. But other than that, it, it's pretty similar. So if y'all don't understand some aspect of that, it, uh, this could be problematic. Otherwise, it'd be pretty, pretty be, be pretty straightforward. It'll pretty be straightforward. Evidently, the words order doesn't matter that much in the English language. It's just that you get all the words out in, in whatever kind of soup you can make. So here we go, everybody. So in the uh, evolution of high mass stars, I want to give you your learning goals. And uh, I've been doing that lately, so I feel uh, compelled to keep on. And of course, I'm really super prepared like I always am. So that's why I'm, I'm not stalling right now to go and find them in my book. Because if I was, I would be finding them. It would be very difficult. But luckily, I had them right here. So the first learning goal is to describe the death of high mass stars and how they differ from that of low mass stars, or I actually paraphrased it, describe how the death of high mass stars differ from that of low mass stars. Learning goal two is list the sequence of stages for evolving high mass stars. So you'll see there's a lot more stages in this one than there were in the low mass stars because pretty much you had uh, hydrogen burning in the core to make helium, then you ran out, then you had hydrogen shell burning with nothing going on in the core, you had a helium flash, and then you had hydrogen shell burning and helium burning in the core. And then if you're really, really on the higher end of the low mass spectra, then you ended up having hydrogen burning, helium burning shell, and then <clears throat> uh, inert core basically made of carbon. So this one has a lot more layers of that. It's like an onion, it's got layers as in uh, uh, Shrek and what is it, Donkey? Donkey said, uh, explain the origin of chemical elements made uh, up to the heavier, <clears throat> up to and heavier than iron. And learning goal four is identify how Hertzsprung Russell diagrams of clusters enable astronomer, astronomers to measure the ages of stars and test theories of stellar evolution. So that's really what you're going for here is uh, this will put a final nail in the coffin on that little check mark of how do we know what we know about stars because I've given you hints and so all this now we're going to finally get to the clusters so you'll understand how we put together uh, with only you know four 450 years of uh, modern astronomy how do we put together the lifespans of things that live no less than hundreds of thousands of years uh, that's an incredible feat all by itself. So what causes a star to explode? 
Uh, this, of course, is the Crab Nebula, which can be found in the constellation of Taurus. It was known as a guest star in 1054 uh, AD, which was uh, actually in their Chinese record uh, of a, uh, basically some culture in China at the time, 1054. Uh, said there was a guest star. They described where it was. It seems to be in what we now call Taurus. <clears throat> I'm not sure if they called it Taurus at the time or if they had some other name for it or whatever. Uh, I, I mean, I'm almost certain they didn't use exactly the same name Taurus, but they, they might have had sort of the uh, translation of it. But they rec uh, recognized this thing uh, as being a new star. It was super bright. It was so bright they saw it during the day for like 30 days. Uh, so it was really, really uh, bright. And generally speaking, the, li the lifetime of this kind of event that you can actually see lasts on the order of 300 days, but it's visible to the naked eye. If it's like pretty close within our own galaxy, it's visible to the naked eye for uh, tens of days, you know, multiple weeks, for instance. So what causes a star to explode? So uh, greater gravitational force leads to higher temperature and pressure, which increase the rate of nuclear fusion, causing the stars to be more luminous and to live different, faster lives. So that's really at the end of, uh, at the, end of the day, the, the crux of the matter. You basically have, instead of uh, 0.08 to three solar masses, we have three solar masses up to uh, theoretical limits, 150 solar masses. We have found, I think to date, we found one or two stars that are higher than 150 solar masses that we've yet to explain. <clears throat> We found uh, numerous stars that are on the order of 120 solar masses, so that's pretty impressive. But from all that, what we know is that uh, they burn brighter, uh, they burn hotter, and because of the increased temperature and pressure at the core, you actually get a whole different process taking place in the core that's way more efficient and therefore can burn hydrogen into helium way quicker so that in the most extreme cases, the, the stars that are on the order of 150 solar masses, they only live for on the order of hundreds of thousands of years. So maybe three, four, five, seven hundred thousand years. That's a pretty short life in terms of astronomical time. That's even a short life in terms of geological time. Uh, so we're gonna learn about why that's so and all that good stuff as well. This right here is the culprit. It turns out that it takes 10 million Kelvin to force two protons together. In other words, what happens is at 10 million Kelvin, the average kinetic energy of the particles in there uh, is very high, right? And if it's below 10 million Kelvin, then it's not as high. And that high kinetic energy allows enough velocity for two uh, repelling particles, two protons to come together despite the, heart, the huge, what they call Coulomb barrier because the Coulomb force, which is just like the gravitational force in formula, uh, repels like particles and attracts unlike particles. So if you want these unlike particles to actually get close enough where there's another force that actually holds them together, because there's got to be another force because the nucleus is only made of neutri uh, neutrons and protons. Well, protons repel each other and neutrons don't have any play whatsoever in the electrical force. Gravity, we've already shown, is way, 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 way weaker than the electric force, like uh, one with 43 zeros after it times weaker. So it's not enough to overcome the electric repulsion that the protons have. The neutrons, like I say, don't play a role in it. So there's only one way that you can have a nucleus that works, and that's the advent of a, uh, or at least the discovery of a new force, and that's called the nuclear force. And later we discover another one that's weaker, and we call that the weak nuclear force, and this one becomes a strong nuclear force. But in order for those two particles to come close enough together for it to overcome that Coulomb barrier and then get the strong nuclear force to interact, you have to be going very, very fast. The particles have to be going very, very fast. And that speed is roughly what the speed of a proton is at 10 million Kelvin. So 10 million Kelvin is the critical temperature for hydrogen fusion. But it turns out that two, uh, two protons running into each other is an extremely low probability event. The rest of the reaction can take place, but it's a low probability event. So it takes several encounters of the proton interacting with a proton before one actually combines with the proton to you know, spontaneously become a neutron like we learned in the proton-proton chain. It turns out though, that if you let this process go on, in other words, if you have some carbon 12 lying around in the nucleus, 
then a carbon 12 readily will take a hydrogen uh, nucleus, which is basically a proton. And when it does, it kicks the atomic number up by one. So it goes from 12 to 13. If the thing stays a proton, then it's going to have to go up an element as well because Z went up, Z being the number of protons. So it does, and it becomes nitrogen 13. That produces gamma radiation because basically there's an extra binding energy here, and that binding energy is released in gamma radiation in terms of uh, basically photons of light that are gamma rays. Uh, then spontaneously, this does not like its existence. This number of protons and neutrons together is not very favorable. So spontaneously what happens is notice the number of particles in the nucleus, 13 does not change, but it drops back down the carbon. That means one of the protons spontaneously became a neutron, not unlike what we saw in the proton-proton chain. So now one of those protons becomes a neutron, gives off a positron, and that uh, and a neutrino, and of course it has to give give out an electron neutrino, but it gives off a neutrino, and then of course that positron is going to combine with an electron uh, and produce two gamma rays. So so far we've gotten uh, one proton in and three gamma rays out and one neutrino out. Now that carbon thirteen will also interact again with a carbon, or excuse me, that carbon thirteen will also. Uh, spontaneously decay again, this time into carbon, or excuse me, into four, uh, nitrogen 14. So what's happening here? Oh, no, that is actually, I, I misread that. It is the hydrogen coming in. So when the hydrogen nucleus, again, a proton comes in, that carbon 13 will be jumped up to 14. And if it stays a hydrogen, then uh, in other words, a proton, then it will have to become a uh, up as Z, in other words, the Z will go up by one and it'll become uh, uh, nitrogen. So, yeah, and nitrogen. Uh, so that becomes nitrogen 14. Now we have 14 nucleons. Of course, one of them is a proton. Uh, that extra binding energy is given off again as a photon, a uh, gamma ray photon. Now, this thing will, when combined with yet another proton, will become uh, oxygen 15. Notice the Z goes up again, but this time it stayed a proton because the N also went up to O, which is oxygen. So now it's created oxygen out of the nitrogen and it's given off the extra binding energy as a gamma ray photon. That is not a stable situation. So the oxygen 15 spontaneously becomes nitrogen 15 by one of its protons becoming a neutron. Again, spitting out a positron and a neutrino. The positron will combine with an electron, making two gamma rays. And then finally, if you allow one hydrogen to hit that, then what will actually pop out is uh, basically this will become a 16. But if you take four away from 16, you get 12. So you'll get carbon 12 and one alpha particle. Now, this convoluted, crappy, holy pile of mess here uh, is very complicated in some sense. Uh, the net reaction, of course, you can simplify into, the, into to these things, and that's helpful. But the big deal here is that uh, this is way more efficient, believe it or not, than the proton-proton chain. In other words, it's like uh, this series of reactions maybe will occur 10 times or more frequently than two protons running into each other and making uh, hydrogen uh, deuterium basically. So because of that, this happens way faster than the proton-proton chain. And because uh, it's unlikely that a high mass star uh, doesn't have access to carbon-12 because, you know, high mass stars live for short lives. And there's been so many born since, you know, 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, then most of them are not first generation stars. In fact, we, there might not be a single first generation star in existence that's a high mass star because of their short lifespans. So all of them should have elements made from previous star deaths and therefore they should have carbon in them. I remember carbon's even created in the lower mass stars. Uh, it's just whether or not it gets out, uh, but the high mass stars certainly it gets out. So the high mass stars convert hydrogen to helium on the main sequence in, in this very different way called the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle. And in this case is what uh, carbon is acting like what we call a, a catalyst, but it's a catalyst not for a chemical reaction, but for a nuclear reaction. So you don't notice the uh, 
nitrogen comes out of it as well as the oxygen comes out of it. So you don't really need the, uh, the nitrogen and the oxygen in there. It's, it's going to be there. All you really need is the carbon 12 and everything else works out. Uh, like I said, this is more efficient, in other words, and higher probability. So also a neat thing is we put together our star models, uh, which basically model the interior of a star such that we have a small core and then we have a thin layer and then a thin layer and a thin layer. And they might be you know, tens of thousands of layers between the core and the outer part of the, of the star. And then we do sort of like what we do with uh, global circulation models. We do a model of uh, those different layers and we assume things like, you know, mass is conserved. So if any mass leaves one shell, it has to enter the shell adjacent to it. And that therefore that shell's mass is gonna go up while the other one went down. Same thing with energy, same thing with photons. And we basically sit, sit together these hydrostatic equilibrium differential equations. Then we let computers solve them simultaneously. It's a big nightmare, but basically you can certainly get a PhD for creating one that works. And when you do that, it turns out with a high mass star, there's actually such a high temperature gradient between the center of the core and the outer part of the core that there's actually convection going on in the core. So before, when we did low mass stars, you had a core and then you had a radiation zone where all the radiation escape from the core would bounce back and forth like in a cosmic Plinko game. Uh, around this high density radiation area and take 100,000 years for a single electron to get from the outer core to the underside of the convection zone. Then there was the convection zone and then there was the photosphere and so on and so forth. Well, in this scenario, what you've got is a inner core and then outside of that sort of a little convection zone that allows circulation within the core so that basically what you get here is helium takes over the position of the core in, in totality, whereas uh, you probably gonna get much more helium taking place at the very, very low radius of a low mass star. And then slowly it might fill up these outer layers. This all comes at once because of that convection. Uh, but just like in a low mass star, once the hydrogen is exhausted in the car, uh, in the core, the star leaves the main sequence and expands and cools. Because it leaves the main sequence, remember what's going to happen is uh, it can't fuse hydrogen and helium, at least for some period of time, and pressure starts to crush it. And it has then that outer shell burning. The outer shell burning is basically the whole volume keeping the rest of gravity at bay. So it has to expand. Of course, when it expands, it uh, becomes dilute. And since it becomes dilute, it actually cools down. So that's expanding and cooling, which means it's going to go up and to the right, but mostly to the right because the cooling is going to be much more significant than the expansion is. The expansion would have to go diagonally like this. Whereas this just goes, it makes a little curve and then goes off completely horizontally. Uh, the high mass stars evolve off the main sequence and become supergiants. So remember this one, the Hayashi track, track was like this and then it went up and to the right, uh, but very prominently upward and less prominently to the right. This is very prominently rightward and very little up. So you can see the little up here, does a little zigzag and comes off this way. Unlike low mass stars, supergiants ignite helium in the non-degenerate core. So yeah, that core collapses, but it's almost the amount of time it takes for the core to collapse is about the same amount of time it takes for it to get hot enough to fuse helium into carbon. Remember at 10 million Kelvin, hydrogen fuses into car, uh, helium, but at 100 million Kelvin, roughly speaking, uh, ha uh, helium fuses into carbon and this hits that instantly. So there's no degenerate core stuff going on here that's not temperature dependent. Uh, so it just has a regular temperature re relationship with pressure and it instantly starts burning helium or almost instantly starts burning helium in the core. Uh, that's why it doesn't uh, have to do quite as much. It doesn't have to expand quite as much as the other one did, but it was already big to begin with. As the radius increases, the temperature falls, so the luminosity remains approximately constant. With the rising central temperatures, heavier elements, carbon, neon, et cetera, fuse generating energy. So uh, as the temperature rises and the core fuel is used up, heavier and heavier elements will fuse until iron is created. The fusion shells build up like the layers of an onion. I also remember if you've ever been in malls, sometimes they'll have these little uh, 
kiosks where basically there's this dude or dudette uh, with various little vats of hot wax and it'll take this little just regular candle on a long wick and it'll dip it several times in the one color and then dip it in several times in another color and just keep doing layers like that. And then it'll come back and do these cool shavings on it. So it makes this really pretty candle. So it's like that, how you keep building it up with different layers. That's what this is. So what happens is the hydrogen fuses in the, uh, well, first off, uh, hydrogen fuses in the hydrogen uh, fuses in helium and then helium fuses into carbon. It also produces oxygen and uh, I think nitrogen, uh, but the main thing is most of it, most of the production is going into carbon. Then at the 100 million Kelvin mark, the carbon starts fusing into uh, oxygen and uh, I think silicon, uh, uh, sodium, uh, oxygen, neon, and magnesium. Once it's uh, run out of carbon to fuse, then then some of those elements are the ones that already exist that can start to fuse, in which case we end up getting neon fusing into oxygen and magnesium. And then when we start running out of neon, we start fusing oxygen into silicon and sulfur. And then once we run out of oxygen, we start fusing silicon and sulfur into iron. And that's the dead end because if you plot a binding energy versus uh, per nucleon versus a number of uh, protons, which is really the, the elements. If you do that, the curve goes up, up, up. It's actually got a lot of zigzags, but it goes up smoothly at the top, reaches a max point and then comes down. The only way you can fuse, which is going from left to right, that means uh, from small atomic number to large atomic number is through fusion. And that only works uh, in such a way to give off energy if the curve is going up. So it goes up, goes up, goes up. But once you get to that peak, there's no more fusion from left to right. The only way you can go the other way is uh, by fission. And that's going from a big atomic number to a small one, in other words, uh, breaking apart. And it turns out that that one actually reaches a peak at that same point. And that point happens to be at the Z for the uh, iron. So the largest binding energy per nucleon of any element we know of is iron. So iron's the natural dead end for all fusion processes. But in the process of all this, because of these frequent burnings, remember when we did this with the low mass stars, we had the Hayashi track, track went up in this way, and then it went up again and then came back down and it might've went up one more time and then went over. Well. That was for the different shell burns, right? Well, the same thing's happening here. Now it's going more left and right instead of up and down, but the same process is going back and forth, back and forth. But each of those back and forth processes uh, is a different shell being formed and so on and so forth. So you end up getting this, what we call the instability strip right along here, where while the star is going through this, it actually appears one luminosity then it comes back appearing at a different luminosity, then it goes back appearing at a different luminosity, and you get what's called variable stars. So that's what the variable stars are. Uh, they're along the instability strip on the hertzsprung russell diagram, and they're ones such as Cepheid variables, which Delta Cephei is uh, one star. I wish you could see it. It's really weird because when I was in grad school, uh, I took a uh, it's uh, L, uh, actually an intermediate level astronomy course. And even in downtown Greenville, where East Carolina was, I could actually see Cepheus in the night sky, but it, uh, the sky is so bright in Virginia Beach area, you can't see it uh, very well. It's just a very dim constellation. But if you can find it, you'll see basically it looks like a house, but one corner sort of jacked up. That jacked up corner is where Delta Cephei is. And we were given a lab where uh, each night that we could go out, we would go out and look at Delta Cephei, find another star that was fairly bright, but looked like the same brightness as that one. And we record it and record the date and then uh, do that over two weeks. And we'd look up the star that we found that it was equally bright as, and if we were lucky, we didn't run into another variable star, but we would find basically its magnitude that way. And in doing so, we made this nice little graph like that. And from that, we could tell the period of uh, Delta Cephei. When you know the period, that gives you the absolute uh, magnitude of the star uh, because there's a relationship between absolute magnitude or brightness, or excuse me, luminosity. And then, of course, we know what the brightness is, so you can actually find the distance of stars. So that's another one of those uh, uh, calibrated candles, if you will, 
that we could use to find distances to, to galaxies and whatnot. So there's some really cool stuff. Other ones are our Leary stars and uh, stuff like that. We'll learn more about that uh, as you're reading, of course. These pulsating variable stars <clears throat> are extremely important in determining distances. I already told you that specifically. They have a period luminosity relationship. I told you about that. So uh, the type one classical Cepheids, which is what uh, Delta Cephei is, uh, is basically along this line. So if you plot the period, if I remember correctly, I think Delta CPI was on the order like seven days. So maybe it would have been right about here. And, uh, but this is what the luminosity would look like. And then you just take the time period from this peak to this peak or from this trough to that trough. That's really the period of the brightness. Once you plot that on a graph, you can find out uh, basically given its period, if you know whether it's a uh, classical Cepheid, a type two Cepheid or RR Lyra, then you can tell whether or not it's, uh, <clears throat> you can tell exactly what its luminosity is. Once you have its luminosity, remember lumi uh, brightness is equal to luminosity over four pi times the distance squared. You can always measure brightness from here, well, assuming you have the equipment, but you can do it. So that gives you the distance away. The Cepheid variables have periods from one day up to hundreds of days. More luminous stars have longer periods. So for instance, some of the type two Cepheids get a little bit longer. As you can see, the classical Cepheids get up to around 50 days. There's other, other types as well, of course, that have even longer. Uh, RR Lyra star, Lyra stars, which is from RR Lyra in the constellation Lyra, in other words. Uh, so there's another variable star. And you find out there's really a lot of variable stars. And there's a lot of double stars too, of course, but uh, the Lyra stars and the variables are what we're talking about. You'll just, anytime you sort of hover your mouse over a particular star, like in uh, Starry Night, if you've got your lab manual with Starry Night, uh, it'll always say probably 90% of the time, it'll say either double star or variable star. So that's how pr uh, prominent they are. So uh, the final days of the high mass star basically go like this. It turns out, by the way, uh, I should mention, uh, I don't think I hinted at it before, but each time the shell burning takes place, uh, the core burning lasts shorter than the previous period. So uh, for instance, the life of a 150 solar mass star might be 700,000 years whereas the hydrogen uh, burning in the core is what lasted uh, 700,000 years. The helium burning in the core and the hydrogen burning shell, maybe it lasts 1,000 years. And then the carbon burning in the core and the helium burning shell and the hydrogen burning shell might only last uh, 100 years. And it gets successively lower and lower and lower to literally hours. So each successive phase is shorter than the previous one. And your book has a table on those various phases for I think two different star masses. I think it does one for 15 solar masses and another one for 25 solar masses. Uh, but that's key to understand the, just like with the low mass stars, well over 90% of, or I should say at least 90% of the star's lifetime is on the main sequence. And that little tail before and after is really the 10% uh, or less, okay? So, uh, example is silicon burning lasts for only a few days. So that's silicon burning into uh, iron, of course. And this is for a very particular star. It might be a 25 solar mass star. Or it might be a 15 solar mass star. Uh, a 15 solar mass star would last less time than a 25 solar mass star, but still it would con be considerably less than the previous cycles. There's the table I was talking about. So 15 solar mass star, you can see hydrogen fusion uh, in this case uh, was 7 million years. Uh, or excuse me, 11 million years, 25 solar mass is 7 million years. That's why I'm saying if you got up to around 120 or 150 solar masses, you're probably talking on, you know, two, three, 400,000 years. That's not very, uh, very large. The helium fusion, this is 2 uh, million years, which is basically two out of a, two of 11, which I think is like 18% uh, uh, the time of what the 11 million years was. Uh, so not not huge, in other words. Uh, 800,000 years for the 25 uh, solar mass star, 2,000 years for the carbon fusion in the 15, eight months for the neon, 2.6 years. Notice that's kind of weird. It jumped from neon uh, to oxygen and actually went higher. Uh, there's reasons for that too, by the way. These reactions uh, from carbon on are actually doing a lot different scenario. We basically, the majority of the pressure uh, the radiation, if you will, 
that is produced in the cores and the shells when these fusion reactions of hydrogen and the helium, helium and the carbon, all those two reactions basically occur with most of the energy going out as photons pressing up against a, a radiative uh, a radiative zone, if you will, that slows it down and helps keep gravity at bay. In other words, the, the outer parts of the star act like a warm, like a blanket keeping it warm and slowing down things on the way out. But once you start getting the carbon fusing and neon fusing, these fusions take place quite differently. Uh, the vast majority of what they're putting out is energy in the form of neutrinos and neutrinos just blow right through the star. Uh, so the star can just continue to shrink uh, ad nauseum. So it's, it's kind of a uh, quicker process. But then you see oxygen went up to 2.6 years. And then, of course, 18 days for the silicon fusion uh, for a 15 solar mass star, uh, less than a day for a 25 solar mass star. So why is each st uh, stage shorter? There's a huge production of neutrinos, which carry energy away. Uh, because that energy is being carried away, remember, uh, the warm blanket, if you don't have the blanket, then the thing doesn't stay warm. So the energy just escapes. And since the energy is just escaping, it gets cooler and cooler and, and you can't do it for so much anyway. So uh, the star can access a huge amount of the energy produced in neutrinos because they've you know, since left the building. There's uh, energy, average binding energy per nucleon I was talking about. Now I'm on a roll here, so I should probably stop and say, uh, does anybody have any questions of what we've, I mean, y'all should interrupt me at any time, no matter how much of a role I'm in, but I just want to double check, make sure nobody has any questions. I'm good. Okay. Just double check and let's say everybody else is okay too, because they didn't say, say anything otherwise. All right. So this is that binding energy per nucleon. And remember the number of nucleons, if you plotted this versus Z, the atomic number, it would give you the actual elements. Of course, this allows you, by doing the total number of nucleons, this allows you to include all the isotopes of the various uh, elements. But the main thing is at uh, iron 56, that has the highest energy per nucleon. You can see it's slightly higher than this guy and considerably higher than this guy. So going uphill from the left is easy or going uphill from the right is easy. Anytime you go downhill from either direction, though, uh, that's hard. OK, in other words, that actually takes more energy in than it gives off. So it's a net loss to the system. So basically what that means is you're very unlikely to get uh, to go from helium to lithium six R to lithium seven R to lithium eight or hydrogen two or hydrogen three or whatever. Right. So all those are, are, are excuse me, these are. Uh, beryllium and boron, my fault. I was looking at thinking it was the other side. So this downward direction is something that doesn't happen naturally. In fact, we learned, this is kind of a bummer, but remember the, the, the Big Bang created hydrogen helium is what we tell everybody. But then we sort of over time start to tell you, well, actually it produced a little bit of beryllium. And we say, oh, well, it actually produced a little bit of lithium. And say, oh, well, it might actually produce a little boron too. Okay, so that's pretty much the three, but it turns out that lithium, uh, beryllium, and boron actually get sucked up by stars. Stars make all the elements except lithium, beryllium, and boron, so that's kind of a bummer, uh, but that also sort of fits with our understanding of the presence of atoms. So all these ideas I'm telling you, we obviously got to, talk, uh, to test those because their hypotheses are, at this point, we're, they're mostly considered theory, uh, so they're, you know, very strong words. And because of that, we got to keep testing them. And it turns out these models that we have used are becoming a theory and in fact are a theory at this point, specifically because all the tests we do to try to test them turns out to be uh, basically true. In other words, we get the hypothesis that we made is the correct one. But it can keep on going up, up, up until it gets to iron. That's when we basically can't fuse anymore. Similarly, if you were doing fission, and fission, remember, is what the first nuclear bomb was, was the atomic bomb, the uh, Fat Man and Little Boy, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Trinity test, all those guys were basically a, a fission bomb where we threw too much of one thing together and a chain reaction occurred, causing uh, basically this large nucleus to break into or 
break into a bunch or at least two initially uh, smaller nuclei. That's what that's what uh, fission is. Fusion is two nuclei coming together to make one big one. Uh, as long as we're going this way, that's fission. And of course, as long as we're going uphill, that can occur. So if fission was a process of stars, this would work all the way up to uh, iron as well. But fusion's the, the work of the stars, so it only works up to iron as well. Uh, kind of interesting that it's iron either way. Well, it's mathematical, duh, but it, it's interesting from a physical standpoint. Uh, I think I've hit everything down here. Iron has the highest binding energy yet. If you use iron requires the energy would drain the star of energy. Yeah. And once the star has an iron core fusion star. Yeah. So basically anything that takes more energy in than it puts out. If you're going uh, to the left, that would be a drop. If you're going to the right, that would also be a drop. So anytime you go down in binding energy, you're basically uh, taking more energy in than you're putting out. That can only happen in an energy rich environment like a supernova. And that's where we find out where the rest of the elements come from. In fact, uh, the things that go on uh, for the various shell burnings and stuff like that inside of a high mass star, they sort of hit every other element roughly uh, from hydrogen all the way up to uh, just about iron, skipping a few here and there, but it basically produces almost everything in the periodic table. But of course, it, it only produces up to iron. Well, that's, you know, number 56, so that's not very uh, impressive. But when the star goes supernova, which is ultimately what's going to happen, it, that's just literally a sea of energy available. And that sea of energy allows basically every type of uh, nuclear reaction to occur. We've verified this in our own labs where you can make a laboratory, put a high enough energy and see the fusion take place and see the fission take place and all sorts of stuff. And from that, we now know that basically anything beyond uh, iron is somewhat rare specifically because it can only be created by the death knell. In, in fact, not even the death knell, but the final death throes of a high mass star. So, you know, the gold jewelry that's so valuable, part of the reason it's so valuable is it's so rare. The silver jewelry, same thing, my gold tooth, but both my gold teeth, they're, <laughs> they're back in the back. I'm not, you know, I'm not all gangster or anything, uh, <laughs> but they're evidently a really, really good uh, crown to use. So anyways, the gold and the silver and the platinum, all these elements that are so uh, rare are specifically rare because they're made in the star's explosion and therefore they're kind of hard to get to. So anyways, that's, that's it. And at the end of the day, when we've done all this modeling and we made all these hypotheses, uh, then we go back and test all these hypotheses. And once we've tested them over and over and over and over and never really found a, an error, or if we did find some minor error, maybe we made some correction to a small part of our, our uh, hypothesis. And then that kept on going. And, and we've had so many, so many correct predictions from our hypotheses that we're now moving from hypothesis into theory that's where we are now and we've got this really robust theory but we keep on testing it and some of the things that would say uh we should test is uh whether there is a buttload of neutrinos for instance that come out uh from a high mass star near its death and yes we've seen that uh whether the elements that have been produced in the universe they're they're quantities are consistent with this life process of a star making those elements. And guess what? Yes, it's, it's consistent. We see sort of exactly what we expect on a statistical basis in the number of uh, hydrogen and helium. Of course, it's only going to be going down because that was basically the 99.999% of what was made in the Big Bang. That's only going down. But lithium and beryllium, that was also there. It's going down as well because stars don't make it, and same thing with uh, boron. But hydrogen uh, he, uh, beyond helium is carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, all those things. Are they being made at the rate that we're seeing them existing in the universe? And yes, they are. So it's, it's really all sorts of checks on our uh, hypotheses so that we've now become a full-fledged theory. So when the star actually does get to its life, uh, the end of its life, Basically, it started making an iron core, and that iron core, of course, can't go anywhere. There's no more energy that can come from it. So, yeah, this is kind of a big deal. It turns out that the mass will be so much larger 
that not even electron degeneracy pressure, remember that uh, uh, Chandrasekhar limit that once you get a certain pressure, the uh, electron degeneracy uh, can't hold up anymore and basically it builds up and stuff like that. Well, this, this is something beyond electron degeneracy. In fact, you, you collapse past electron degeneracy and you end up getting uh, something called neutron degeneracy. So uh, at the core, the core of iron can be pushed so hard that electrons are forced into the nucleus of the atom and spontaneously the, uh, the electrons with the neutrons will combine to form actual protons, uh, excuse me, with the protons will combine to form actual neutrons and you end up getting basically a big pile of, pile of neutrons that is the really, really super hot core and you have a uh, de neutron degeneracy pressure that's holding up. So the same electron degeneracy pressure we had for white dwarfs, now we have it again, except it's a higher number uh, and it's for neutron degeneracy instead of electron degeneracy. And the uh, mass, most large mass that you can have for that is about three solar masses as opposed to the 1.6 that we had for, I think it was 1.6 for the electron degeneracy. So as long as it's not higher than that, we're gonna get this cool neutron core. Uh, as the core collapses, the core temperature climbs so high that protons dis dis disintegrate. Uh, uh, photo disintegrate, excuse me, iron. So what that means is the photons are, are so energetic that they're actually uh, sort of combining, hitting the nucleus and combining with it to uh, convert the protons to other things. So that's kind of crazy. You're actually uh, building smaller nuclei now instead of bigger nuclei. And the core becomes so dense that electrons are absorbed by protons uh, in the atomic nuclei, forming neutrons and releasing neutrinos and photo disintegration and electron absorption reduce the pressure in the core. The collapse accelerates. In fact, the collapse uh, will reach on the order of half to three quarters of the speed of light. It's, it's that fast of flying in and then it bounces back and, and starts to blow out that way. When that happens, you get the cool explosion. So here's the core collapse process. Uh, I think this was, I don't think this is Ada Car Carina. I think this was, uh, I think this is 1987A, maybe. I, I, you can look it up in your book. Anybody does, let me know. Uh, so the high temperature changes the core through photo disintegration. In photo disintegration, gamma rays in the core break the iron apart. So you literally have gamma ray photons. These are just photons now. They're hitting uh, the iron and breaking it apart, reversing the fusion. So they're actually able to bring and create more elements that are down below iron this way. Uh, Evidently, it doesn't make uh, boron, beryllium, and lithium, but still, it, it does produce some of the other things. And the high pressure changes the core via charge destruction. And in charge destruction, the electrons are forced into protons, producing neutrons and neutrinos. That's what they mean by charge destruction. You're taking something that has a charge, positive like proton, and it's combining with something negative like the electron and making basically neutral neutrons and neutrinos. Until nuclear forces suddenly become repulsive, the overcompressed core bounces, driving its outer layers outward through the star. You get a shock wave. The expanding shock is strengthened by the pressure of a hot bubble of trapped neutrinos. So at this point, uh, neutrinos, which pass through, remember, a, a light year thick chunk of lead, no problem. And generally through stars, no problem. At this point, you're getting stuff so dense that even the neutrinos are, uh, I want to say, slowed down. Uh, that all depends, of course, if their mass is zero, which we don't think it is. Uh, but if their mass were zero, they couldn't slow down. They could only travel at the speed of light, just like photons. But either way, the shock continues through the outer layers of the star, blasting forth in what we call a type two supernova and leaving behind the collapsed remains of, a, of the core, namely a neutron star. Now, this is the three to eight solar mass range. If you go beyond the eight solar mass range, uh, and in fact, if the star exceeds the three solar mass, the core that's left ex exceeds three solar mass, it can't be a neutron star either because the three solar mass is too high of a pressure for neutron degeneracy to stop it. So it ends up cr uh, creating a black hole, which we'll cover next chapter. But if the star was initially three to eight solar masses, uh, a good chance of this occurring is, uh, or the chance is very high that this will occur and end in a neutron star but that's because most of the mass will be lost or a lot of the mass will be lost through all these processes. Any questions on that? 
it's weird. Uh, neutrinos are, are this weird particles that don't interact much, but when they do, because they're traveling so fast, they actually make a big deal. Uh, and if you get a super dense situation, you can get neutrinos interacting and neutrinos are actually what we believe is the, the main cause of the supernova explosion. Uh, you'll see here's the type 1A supernova, so that's when we were talking about uh, two stars in a binary system. Uh, basically, when the uh, star explodes and becomes a thermonuclear producer again, specifically because it uh, exceeded the transit shakar limit, then it'll uh, reach some max luminosity and then fall off like this and then fall off linearly over a 300 day period. If you get this kind of curve, then you know uh, exactly what the luminosity is because we worked out the, the history of this, not only by watching them occur, but also by our models. And then if you see this type of curve, then you know it's a type two supernova. And that means it didn't have to have a binary star system. That means it was a high mass star. Uh, and again, you can watch these processes and learn luminosities from them and use them as standard candles or what I called earlier, calibrated candles. So a lot of energy is emitted from a supernova. Uh, One billion suns worth of light energy is emitted. So remember our galaxy is about 100 uh, billion, or excuse me, 10 billion stars in our galaxy. We're talking about a tenth of all the uh, stars in our galaxy worth of light. So yeah, it turns out the sun, if it went supernova, or any star for that matter, when it goes supernova, it's going to be bright as comparable in brightness as the whole galaxy is itself, and in fact, possibly more. It's 100 times more energy is emitted as kinetic energy than as light energy. So even though you see this huge 10 to the 15th times the solar luminosity uh, in a supernova, still the vast majority of the energy is given off as kinetic energy of particles flying out. And 100 times that now is energy of neutrinos. So you've got all these neutrinos uh, coming out, carrying 100 times more energy than the kinetic energy of the particles that are being sent out. And that's uh, 100 times bigger than the energy put out by light. So kinetic energy is transferred to the interstellar medium as a shock wave. Uh, this begets new star formation. So you can imagine a shock wave blowing through an interstellar medium cloud, a molecular cloud, the most densely packed areas are going to get squished even more dense because basically they're so massive they're going to sit still, but this side is going to pu uh, be pushed by the shock wave into it so the mass comes closer together. So it sort of helps that gravitational process that may have taken place and may not have, but by helping that it's now caused a new star to generate and in fact many new stars and you'll get, for instance, a, a star cluster being formed. And not only that, the matter that came with it seeded that intermolecular cloud, uh, that molecular cloud or interstellar medium type cloud, it seeded it with some of the new elements that the uh, supernova made, as well as, you know, the star before it, making all those things up to iron, and then the supernova made, uh, nova, getting rid of a few elements, but also uh, making elements beyond iron. So when we do look at the statistical analysis of how many stars are made per year, how many star or you know, per decade or whatever you want to do, uh, how many stars there are per unit volume, how many volumes of space can we see? When you do all that statistics, you get a, a rough estimate of how much hydrogen there should be, a rough estimate of how much helium there should be. You're taking into account, of course, which stars are high mass stars, which mass are really low mass stars, which mass are super high mass stars, and how much each of those are putting out in terms of uh, the, the various elements when they do finally die. And that should give you a rough estimate of the number of, of atoms relative to hydrogen. And it sort of matches this curve. So because of that, we're again, more confident about our theory on how stars live and die. So you see hydrogen and helium, of course, are really the most predominant because they were created in the Big Bang. You'll see lithium, beryllium, and boron are quite low. Uh, they were produced very small amounts anyways, and we see that stars pretty much are eating them up too. So lithium, beryllium, and boron are not uh, very prevalent. Carbon is, and oxygen are more prevalent than nitrogen. And then, of course, after oxygen, whoa. 
So you basically, this is the element number. So you're actually going through the atomic number at that point. But you can see all this little sawtooth pattern. And notice it peaks right around iron, and then it starts to fall off because this is, you know, the supernova stuff, the stuff that's made in supernovas, uranium's over here. By the way, plutonium, not naturally occurring. We had to make that. We discovered that we could make that in the process of making uranium-239, which is what we needed to make uh, nuclear weapons. So that's not naturally occurring, but we can make it. And, you know, in some process, uh, nuclear reactions can actually uh, create that stuff. Uh, the shockwave heats and pushes the interstellar medium. The nucleosynthesis occurs as the new elements are created. All atoms, uh, all atoms, iron and heavier are made in supernova explosions, like I told you. So uh, not even electron disintegration pressure can stop the collapse of the iron core. We're going through the, the process where they're, where they're basically showing you how the explosion occurs. So as the core collapses, the core temperature climbs so high that the photons photo design. I swear they put this, maybe it's because they give this day, because they're given the diagram that they've done before, but I think it's because they're given some new information down here at the bottom. So I'll just read through it and show you what's going on. As the core collapses, the core temperature climbs so high that photons photo disintegrate iron. We talked about that before. You're seeing it here, an electron and a proton come together to form a neutrino and a, neutri uh, a neutron. And the core becomes so dense that the electrons are absorbed. But yeah, that we've done all that. So if the star is not too massive, the type two supernova leaves behind a neutron degenerate core, a neutron star. And by the way, this neutron star, the white dwarf was kind of cool in that a teaspoon weighed as much as maybe a Mack truck. So, you know, a, a teaspoon of material would weigh as much as a fully loaded Mack truck. A teaspoon of the neutron material, by the way, which literally has a mass between 1.4 and up to a maximum of three solar masses, but it's fit in the size that's roughly 10 to 20 kilometers in diameter. New York City is about 1.7 kilometers. I mean, excuse me, uh, Washington, D.C. is about uh, 1.6, 1.7 kilometers square. So you can literally fit a neutron star, which has a mass from 1.4 to three solar masses in DC, just slightly bigger than DC, or actually slightly smaller than DC on the small end. So you can imagine how dense that must be. And in fact, it's so dense that if you took a teaspoon of that, it would weigh as much as a, uh, as a Mount Everest. So it's just it's really freaking huge. Here is one of the end results. The neutron star, remember, the star probably rotated, especially high mass stars. They might rotate, you know, once a day or maybe once every 30 days. You know, our star is like a 28 day cycle or something like that. But these stars, of course, they rotate as well. Uh, conservation of momentum doesn't just let that rotation go away. And in fact, all the mass now is condensed to really small. So this is like a, an ice skater who starts spinning only like she's got 500 pound hands and her hands are like a, a mile uh, on the end of mile long arms. So she starts spinning with her arms way out like this, woof, 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 like this. And then she brings those 500 pound hands in from a whole mile out. And now she's spinning super, super fast. In fact, uh, 60, 70 times per second, maybe. Uh, that's what a neutron star is because now all that mass it shrunk so small due to you know gravitational collapse basically that it's super massive but angular momentum which is a product of mass location of mass and how fast it spins since the mass uh did not go down it stayed roughly the same but the distance out from the center that the mass was shrunk that can only be compensated by the spin rate going up so one went down and since it had to be a constant, the other one had to go up. The one that went up was the speed of rotation. So these things spin really fast. They always have magnetic fields. Sometimes they have super, super strong magnetic fields in which call, in case they're called a magnetar. And the magnetar will have a strong magnetic field that doesn't necessarily along with the align with the rotation axis, as we know. If one of these uh, basically poles of the magnetic field happens to zoom by in such a way that it hits our eyesight, then we have a pulsar. Because all pulsars are neutron stars, but not all neutron stars are pulsars. And the reason being is a neutron star can have a pulse of light coming out, but we never see it if it's not pointed at us. In which case we just call it a neutron star. 
uh, it very well may be a pulsar for some other uh, distant uh, galaxy uh, inhabitants. But what we see is either the, the one of the flashes hitting us, both of the flashes hitting us, or none of the flashes hitting us. And either way, when we see one or more, one or two of the flashes hitting us, then we call it a pul pulsar. And if we don't see one, then we, it's just a, a neutron star. Uh, these were predicted by uh, Bade and, and Fritz Zwicky. Zwicky's a neat little character. Anyways, he predicted them. Uh, other people later discovered them. In fact, what they discovered at one time was a intense uh, radio signal that was coming out with super regular frequency. And they called it LGM, meaning little green men. They literally thought it might be an alien species contacting us because it was so regular. But we've now gotten so good that we can watch them long enough that we can see and measure the energy. And what we see is the speed is actually decreasing because they are actually losing energy to synchrotron radiation. Radiation is firing out in circles. And the magnetic field, of course, is uh, interacting with particles and making particles speed up and stuff like that. And because of that, that's stealing energy from the rotation. So the rotation is slowing down ever slowly. And we can actually detect that slowing, uh, which further confirms it wasn't little green men. So that's kind of cool. Now, in a binary system, you can get sort of the same stuff that happened in the low mass star situation. Only with this, uh, it becomes basically the neutron star over here. And the energy is so high that it actually will put out uh, x-rays. So what's happening is there's such a large gravitational well from the neutron star. It goes such a long way that the particles speed up so much falling into the secretion disk that their energy goes beyond the visible spectrum, uh, well beyond the, the ultraviolet spectrum, and in fact, into the uh, x-ray. So, you know, not quite gamma rays, but still in the x-rays. So evolving star overflows its Roche lobe, pouring matter onto a neutron star. The infalling matter heats parts of the accretion disk to x-ray emitting temperature and feeds relativistic jets from the rotating neutron star. So these jets on the side, remember, they're aligned with the uh, magnetic field poles and they are actually shooting particles out, charged particles at relativistic speeds, you know, comparable to the speed of light, in other words. And we're getting this X-ray accretion disk. We've seen this. We've, we've got photos that show, you know, something bulbous with uh, an X-ray uh, flat plane and two jets. We've got photographs of that we found uh, in, in the galaxy uh, and other galaxies, for that matter, just uh, not quite being able to get all the details from other galaxies because they're so far away. Uh, the Crab Nebula, that was the one. The Crab Nebula is the one, like I said, that's in uh, Taurus. I think that was the one I saw earlier, wasn't it? I was trying to remember what question. No, that's not the same. Good. So I wasn't a complete build, though. I knew it was something different. So the Crab Nebula is a remnant of a type, type new supernova. It was witnessed by the Chinese in 1054 CE. That's the new, you don't use a, AD and BC now uh, for several reasons. One, it's, you know, uh, we know Christ wasn't actually born on the zero years, probably somewhere between three and six. Uh, and other reasons is Christ uh, means Christos, which means anointed one. And Christ isn't the anointed one, but except for, you know, one religion or several branches of one religion. So it's not really correct to call it that anyway. So they say uh, the common era, which is after Christ, which would be uh, AD, and then before the common era, BCE. So that's why they use that. But it was recorded as a guest star. It lasted in the sky for over three weeks, and its current glow is powered by a pulsar. So we can see the pulsar in there. Uh, you can actually do Doppler shift on these rings of gas and dust, and you can see, in fact, the velocity is such that all of this gas and dust would have been roughly right at the center where the, where the pulsar is. Uh, back in 1054. So that's uh, sort of the neat way in which we can put the final nail in the coffin. If we think something occurred in some historical time period, if we can trace back the velocities of the cloud of gas and dust leaving it and trace back to how far it should be based on its speed, maybe even taking into account, you know, interacted with certain kinds of media, then you can find basically the time at which all that mass was at one point, which is what a star looks like. And if that date comes, you know, fairly close to what we have in history, then you're, you're probably right. So that's pretty cool. 
So how do we figure out all this stuff? That that's the big question. You know, how do you take over 400, 450 years, you know, since the invention of the telescope, not by Galileo, but by Lipperhey, I think it was. Uh, how do you take uh, that time period and figure out the life span of stars who's literally the shortest lived ones are 100,000 years? Well, it's sort of like an, an alien species flying over Earth and examining every human for exactly one second, because one second of our life is to roughly 75 years of our average lifespan, as 400 and so years are to uh, the average lifespan of a star, say 10 billion. So that's what we did. And it turns out, if you plot uh, star clusters instead of just a star, you plot the whole cluster. So like the Hyades, the, the little V that makes Taurus's head, that's called the Hyades, that's a star cluster. A bunch of the stars in Orion is a star cluster. Uh, the Pleiades is another star cluster, as you can see right here, there's the Pleiades, here's the Hyades. Uh, M3, that's another cluster, M11, that's another cluster. Uh, I'm trying to remember which one was in the center of, of cancer. I want to say that might, that might have been M33. Uh, but anyways, that's another one. And if you look at that, even with binoculars, you'll be amazed at how many stars you can see in that emptiness between Castor and Pollux and Leo. Just look in that center area. You'll see something sort of blurry if the, if the uh, sky is not too bright you'll see a blurriness with your eye, eye. and then you take just binoculars or even a, a monocle or or a, a cheap telescope and just aim it at it and you will be in awe by how many stars you can see but when you plot these clusters it turns out they basically form a, a main sequence line on the hertzsprung russell diagram so you'll get that typical you know luminosity versus temperature hertzsprung russell diagram that'll go from the bottom right to the top left. But what you find out when you plot a single cluster, they'll have all these bottom right stars in there. And if it's new, you might even have some stuff where it actually uh, is a proto star. So you can see the track of it going onto the main, uh, onto the main sequence, but you'll have it running all along the main sequence because when a cluster is formed, the, the mass that each little random clump gets is a random variable. So the mass is what dictates where it's going to end up on the main sequence. Uh, so you'll have stars from 0.08 solar masses, maybe up to almost 150 solar masses. And if you take and plot them, what you'll see is they all stay along the main sequence and then they start to leave. They start to leave and they start to leave. Well, what we know from what you've seen so far is this end of the main sequence is the shortest lived this end of the main sequence is the longest lived and what's happening is the cluster was basically a group of stars that was in one cloud that probably had one of those uh bow shock type waves coming from a supernova that ignited the uh the initial lighting of the stars so all the stars in the cluster probably came from some certain event like that and though there was some time between the first one lighting and the last one lighting that time was probably very very small compared to their total lifetime so you know i'm talking like years tens of years maybe even hundreds of years uh from the first one igniting to the last one igniting from this cloud density cloud blowing through or this bow shock if you will blowing through when it actually comes through there all of those things start to ignite essentially at the same period of time and therefore the uh, ones that die first are the ones that will start to leave the main sequence well obviously that's your most massive stars so if you do that with one cluster and then you say okay well according to our solar models this particular type of star should last this long and you say, okay, well, this particular type of star that I just said left at this time period. So that time period must be say uh, five times 10 to the 11th years. So you've now got a, a single standard that you based on both your model as well as the existing uh, star clusters and you stick with that. And then you say, okay, well, what's gonna happen with uh, the other types of stars? Well, according to our model, this one lived this long and you'll see all those stars are out there. When you plot all of them, you can tell the age of the cluster specifically by the turn off. So when it starts to turn off the main sequence, that gives you the life of that, the lifetime of that particular star. And that happens to be the same as the lifetime of that particular cluster. That's how we put the life together. Does that make sense? It's, it's a, uh, it's not an easy logical step to make, uh, but it, it is 
a clean logical step. So globular clusters are very dense with up to millions of stars. Open clusters are looser with a few dozen to a few thousand stars. Uh, for instance, the Pleiades is an open cluster. M33 is a, a globular cluster. What we find, I think, if I remember correctly, we'll, we'll cover this when we go over galaxies, is the open clusters tend to be more in uh, the plane of our galaxy, and the globular clusters are in the whole sphere of our galaxy. So here's some uh, cool looking diagrams. So this is a plot of obviously a buttload of stars in a cluster. And you can see it lies right along that main sequence until it leaves, right? And you can even see some of them start to go back over here and meandering over to the white dwarf area. You can see some of them in that, you know, uh, asymptotic giant branch and stuff like that. Uh, this cluster is near the remains of the cloud from which it formed. So uh, there's a presence of massive luminous hot stars show this open cluster is very young. So there's an open cluster. This is the cloud from which it was formed. Uh, the, the absence of massive luminous hot stars on the main sequence shows this globular cluster is very old. Notice there's no gas and dust, but that's not unlike that, that one I was telling you about in the middle of uh, cancer. And it might be M55 for that matter. Uh, Y'all can Google that for yourself. But inside of cancer, you'll see something that looks just like that. That's cool to think of that. I mean, that's, that's literally millions of stars all formed basically from the same cloud of gas and dust. And uh, now it looks sort of like a galaxy, even though it's really just a group of stars with no uh, real orderliness about it. Here's some other main sequence or some other main sequences divergence. Uh, so uh, this is a zero age main sequence. So when a, when a star cluster is zero age, then basically every star happened to, to become a star at the same instant. And there's a whole litany of stars from 0.2 solar, actually from 0.08 solar masses, probably up to 150 solar masses. So you see they're all there. But at the uh, 20 solar mass line, after 4 million years, this one leaves. Uh, and the 10 million years, this one starts to leave. Obviously, at 100 million years, this one starts to leave. Obviously, at 1 billion, these start to leave. And then finally, at 10 billion, a single solar mass star starts to leave. So that's really what the graphs look like. The stellar populations are groups of stars with similar ages and other sh uh, shared characteristics. Young, young stars tend to have a more massive, uh, more massive elements in them than older stars. That's what you'd expect if the more massive elements are being created by stars dying, because the more time that passes, the more stars have died, and therefore the more of the elements created by those stars are uh, entered. The supernova see the universe of massive elements which then get incorporated into the next generation of stars and we are done so uh let me stop sharing and you guys are welcome to stick around ask me any questions you might have uh we're actually done we've completely finished chapter 17 now uh we've got another test coming up soon uh we're probably going to hit on the order of a test a week for the, about the rest of the semester so uh just stay stay tuned and, and listen and don't miss them okay you're free to go. Thank you. Hey, um, I had a question about um the lab. Yes. The observation lab. Um, I wasn't able to do it. I know it's due today. Is Which it, one? The, you said the winter circle. Yeah. Yeah, I, it, it's fine. The the weather was touchy at best. I, I'm I giving you at least another week for that. So go ahead. It's no problem. I think it's going to be clear tonight. You might be able to get one. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll go ahead and uh, try tonight. Yeah. And I didn't even, I'm not going to put it as a late. I'll, I'll go ahead and change the due date. If it still says tonight, uh, I'll change the due date to at least next week. Okay. All right. And another question. Um, do you know the energy efficiency of a supernova? Like I know when like a regular matter comes with uh, anim a antimatter. Right. Uh, efficiency, right? Well, the efficiency is a weird thing to, to, do in the case of uh, a star because uh, normally when you talk about efficiency, it's what you get. In other words, what's beneficial that you get divided by how much energy you put in. In some sense, yes, it's 100 percent efficient in, in the sense that uh, you're not you're not creating any energy, you're not creating any mass uh, energy, I should say, and you're not destroying any mass energy. Everything's converting back and forth at 100 percent rate uh, from mass to energy or from energy to other forms of energy. So in that sense, it's 100 percent efficient. When we talk about efficiency, 
uh, we mainly mean that several, uh, in the case of a, a core of a star, we'd have to mean something along the lines of how many, how many nuclear interactions are there before an actual energy producing nuclear reaction occurs. And, and that, that process with the proton proton chain is probably on the order of less than a percent, maybe even less than a hundredth of a percent. Whereas on the CNO cycle, it's probably on the order of 1%. That makes sense. Yes, sir. Yep, that makes sense. All right, have a good one, Aria. Aria, Aria. Yeah, bad with names. <laughs> Amani, Abigail. Autumn. Uh, I know Abigail's got came back for a question about a, a practice test. No, I'm fine. Thank you. I'll see you at lab today. Okay, see you at one one o'clock, everybody. Uh, Abigail, you want me to take you to a breakout room and we can discuss your test? Um, it doesn't really matter. Autumn can stay. Um, so. For the, it was only three questions that I really uh -huh. was con, like confused about. So one of them was the surface of the sun appears sharp when we look at it in visible light because, and I put the photosphere is cooler than the layers below it. That is, uh, I mean, that's true, but the reason is the thinness of the solar, of the photosphere. Uh, but I have to look at the actual question to see what the answer choices are because there's a, a couple things that go into it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and go into... Uh, your grades. I'm not doing this on the screen. I'm going to go into your particular grades, go to your test four. And was this the last test you took that, or was it one of the previous tries? That um, had it, was that? The, it was the last try. Okay. I'll pull up that test and I'll try to find that question and help you with that directly. Uh, it shouldn't take a second. Well, my browser just said, your browser's being slow. You want to stop it or you want to wait? I want to wait. <laughs> And just All a reminder, right. I'm going to go get my COVID shot today. So. Oh, yeah, you see, you can't make lab. Yeah. That's okay. I, I, I think I'm going to have a, another in lieu of assignment, so it shouldn't be a big deal missing lab today. Okay. Because, you know. It's something you can do and still be counted, more or less. Yeah. So, Abigail Kendrick. Sucks. <laughs> yeah, do, you, do you realize I'm supposed to be one's... 1B and they still have the state still hasn't gotten contact with me to get yeah that's crazy I couldn't imagine just sitting there waiting for any state organization to get in touch with me it'd be a nightmare and and then and the, to top it off they're starting 1C soon and it's just like um, yeah but you're <laughs> so you not got done with on 1Bs Abigail I just found that luckily it was question number one yeah. Uh, the surface of the sun appears to be sharp when we look at it in visible light, and that's because the photosphere is thin compared with the outer layers of the sun. Uh, basically, that thinness makes the what we call limb darkening. That was what we talked about in class. The other choices were the photosphere is much less dense in the convection zone. Its high light luminosity prevent, uh, provides plenty of proton, photons, resulting in extreme definition. And the sun has a distinct surface. So, yeah, it's the it's the fact that the photosphere is thin compared to the outer layers. The photosphere being uh, cooler is the reason that we see an absorption spectrum. So okay. I don't know if you got that mixed up uh, or what. Uh, did you want to know what the deal is with the other couple of questions? Um, well, I know why I got some of them wrong, but the ones I was confused about was question two and then question 23. Okay. okay, so I'm looking at two now. It says density, temperature, and pressure increase as you move inward in the interior of the sun. This means that the weight of the star pushing inward at a given gradius blank as, as you move toward the core. Yeah, that should increase. Uh, basically, remember, the deeper you go, like in the ocean, the more ocean that's on top of you, that's the same thing that's happened with the star. The deeper you go into the star, the more matter above you is pushing inward. That's why it increases. You wrote decreases. I, I'm thinking that was just a, you weren't thinking clearly and made a boo-boo because uh, I, I suspect you knew that one off the top of your head, just uh, just maybe got confused about what they were asking about. Okay. They didn't word it very well. It says density, temperature, and pressure increase as you move inward in the interior of the sun. This means that the weight of the star pushing inward at a given radius blank as you move toward the core. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a big, ugly, wordy sentence, but it's, I mean, it's correct to say it, the true answer is increases. It's just not a very pretty question. So sorry about that. Okay. Uh, 23 was your other one? Yeah. If one star appears brighter than another in the night sky, then the brighter star, ah, there's a couple different ways. Remember brightness, uh, 
depends on luminosity and distance away. So if you know the two stars have the same luminosity, then uh, the brightness would mean it's closer. But in the case where you don't know its luminosity, the brighter star could be really far away, but way brighter. Or the lighter, or the brighter star could be really close to us, and not nearly as bright. So that's really what the the problem is. The correct answer for that one should be cannot be compared to a dimmer star without more information. Okay, that's what I thought it was, but then I was like, no, it's closer. Like that makes sense. Second <laughs> but... guessing yourself, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's one of those ones where I'm really I'm taxing you. I'm putting you to test to say, do you really know all the things that could go into how bright a star appears, and do you know the difference between brightness and luminosity? So it's like six different questions in that one question. It's not, it looks easy because it's multiple choice, but it's, it's actually a, a very taxing college level science question because you got to think, wait a second, it's brighter. That just means more photons are hitting me than another star. Was well, that more photons are hitting me because it's closer to me? Or is that more stars are, uh, more photons are hitting me because despite being farther, it's way brighter? And, and various other things, because really the, the only thing that luminosity depends on is the temperature and the surface area, which is a radius. So if they had the same luminosity and brightness, the one that appeared brighter would be the closer one. Exactly. Yes. Okay. That's like when we compare uh, Betelgeuse and Rigel. They're about the same distance away. We know that uh, Rigel is technically brighter, but before they actually thought Betelgeuse was brighter, so they called it alpha. Because those are the same distance, we can tell that the uh, the two stars must have roughly the uh, same luminosity because they are the same distance away and have roughly the same brightness. Okay, that makes okay. sense. Thank you. No problem. You want to know what pisses me off about this test? That if I, I scroll up, things. that if I scroll up and my mouse clicks on <laughs> one of the random answers, like the wavelength of an it FM radio the station, the broadcast is on a 104.0 mm -hmm. i know it's 2.88 mm -hmm. but i clicked when i scrolled down 288 hertz that happens with me when i'm making the test too using that little the mouse ball or the mouse wheel it, you it, do that it'll change the radio buttons any kind of buttons that have choices built under it they're called radio buttons yeah <laughs> it just scrolls down and it screws you up do, do you do you know how much i'm staring at this last test and i'm like i would have missed three answers Yep. And that's sort I, of I what you got to do with off. that last minute is just make look back and see that your mouse didn't accidentally change some of the points or change some of the answers just because it's a punk. So. And, and I'm just like, oh, 40 questions. I made a 77 point. No, I didn't. It's not a 77.5. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh...